Nightcast. Stephen Lloyd Gilbert brings you the current news from the world today and how it relates to Bible prophecy. Understanding the end time events leading to the peaceful world tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Lloyd Gilbert. Greetings, friends, and welcome to this May 7, 2014 edition of Nightcast. Tonight in the news, we'll open up with news, our first story from Russia related to the Ukraine. Russia's President Vladimir Putin has said Ukraine's presidential election on the 25th of May is a step in the right direction. Moscow has been in military mood this week, preparing to celebrate 69 years since it defeated Nazi Germany. And all against the backdrop of Russia annexing Crimea less than two months ago and the fighting in eastern Ukraine. But in the Kremlin today, President Putin showed his first sign of wanting to de-escalate the tensions in Ukraine. In a meeting with the President of Switzerland, he insisted Russia had pulled back its troops from the border, and then he called on the armed pro-Russian activists in eastern Ukraine to delay their controversial referendum. We call on the representatives of southeast Ukraine, the supporters of the federalization of the country, to postpone the referendum scheduled for May the 11th. It could be a significant breakthrough, though a source close to President Putin told me Russia would only support presidential elections in Ukraine this month if the government in Kiev engaged in serious talks with the East. And the key question, as Mr. Putin left the room, was whether the pro-Russia activists will do as he asks. It was a dramatic move by President Putin, wrong-footing everyone just four days before the referendum was due to be held. So with the situation in Ukraine deteriorating by the day, President Putin may just have blinked. But if so, why? One answer could be the Russian economy. People's lives have been transformed in the last 15 years as oil money has paid for Western consumer goods. But it could all be put at risk by further sanctions. The consequences could be dire. I would say that if Russia breaks down, it will break up, or it may be break up. Spring is just arriving in Moscow, but it has been overshadowed by the fighting over the border. President Putin may have calculated that it's now time to consolidate his gains, rather than risk everything by going for broke in Ukraine. Daniel Sanford, BBC News, Moscow. Thank you, Daniel. And... An update on this, friends, or another another uh, reporter has a story related to this, the internal conflict for Ukraine's young professionals uh, will be the subject of this next video. The pro-Russian separatist and government forces <clears throat> is are continuing in the east of Ukraine. <clears throat> in the capital, Kiev, over 500, 500 kilometers away, young professionals are getting on with their daily lives. But the mood among, among them is far from distant to the conflict, as David Stern reports. It's a typical night in Kiev. A group of friends have gathered at the house of Anya Pranoza. It's her birthday. The wine is flowing freely, there's barbecue, but the events in the other parts of the country are not far from people's minds. My native language, which I is speaking, thinking, and writing is Russian. Uh, but I know Ukrainian fluent, like second native one, maybe second or first, I don't know exactly. And it's not a problem. And I think that these people do not, if they do not like Ukraine and Ukrainian, uh, they should go out of Ukraine. They should leave? Yeah, they should leave because uh, Ukraine cannot be divided into Ukrainian and Russian part. Uh, People who want to live with Putin and with Russia, they should go. How has these events in Ukraine affected your family? 
uh, we have a relatives in uh, Moscow. Uh, every year uh, they come to us in Kiev uh, to spend some time. Um, this year uh, they call us and tell us that we are Banderovsi. Banderovsi means fascist, right? It's, it's, the, it's like a Nazi. They, or they, they think it's like a Nazi, right? Yep. And so they're not coming to, they say they're not going to... Yes, come. this year they coming, uh, don't come in class. Are you, are you going to fight? Uh, if uh, my country needs me, I go. It's very big pain in our heart. It's only, can I say... Fred, you heard uh, some people saying that if some of those people aren't with Ukraine, they, they should go. Now, it's, it's a little bit complex in a certain way because the area where Crimea is, a good number of those people have a Russian culture and background and speak the Russian language and they, they do trade with Russia. And so uh, that area which, if the Ukraine honors what Russia has done in the way of annexing Crimea and grabbing it, Russia once had, what, Crimea was once part of Russia, as many of you know. And so Russia took it back, Indian givers. But, you know, um, uh, but in a way it makes, us, it makes sense in a way. And the, the young gal that was saying, hey, if you don't like, want to be a part of Ukraine, Ukraine should be united, then, then you should go. Well, okay, then let Crimea go. Yeah, that part's simple. Well, there are other areas which are, uh, have Russian-speaking people and Russian backgrounds, and yet there's more to the story that's not even in these stories tonight. There are some stories you can read or see that explain how Russia has sent people into these areas who are not in military uniform. They're not m military troops, but they're part of Russia who are well trained for stirring up uh, and instigating strife and manipulating that strife into uh, shaping uh, the majority of the people in the area to yeah yeah we're against the other side. You know they they know how to they know how to how to, uh, what's the word they used in Germany, pro pro uh, propaganda. They know how to propagandize. So there's a lot behind this. There's a whole lot behind it. And, the, and there's a source behind this, uh, an old dragon, that old serpent Satan, the god of this world, is behind and stirring up and fomenting a lot of this that's going on. Because if he can sow discord and strife among people, and then cause them to war against one another and kill one another. Why, he's flag waving, you know, and he feels like he's defeating God's purpose. And yet, really, in some ways, he's he's working right along with God's purpose to show that man cannot govern himself without Jesus Christ and the God family and the kingdom of God in charge. That's the bottom line of the whole thing right there. Friends, we're watching China. And our next story relates to China. Uh, another sea incident over there. China ships collide in the south. Uh, a Vietnam and Chinese ship collide in the South China Sea. The Vietnamese Navy was trying to prevent the Chinese from setting up an oil rig in an area uh, claimed by both nations. This incident is the most serious at sea between uh, the two parties. Hung Nugen reports. This footage released by the Vietnamese Coast Guard shows what they say is a Chinese ship intentionally ramming a Vietnamese vessel. Officials in Hanoi said their navy was trying to stop the Chinese from setting up an oil rig in an area that is claimed by both countries. Maritime police and fishing protection forces have practiced extreme restraint. 
will continue to hold on there and resolve all issues at sea. But all restraint has its limit. If Chinese ships continue to ram into us, we will respond with similar self-defense. Vietnam said sailors had been injured and several boats damaged during the collisions. But China claims it's the Vietnamese who are in violation of its sovereign rights. This is the most serious incident between the two countries in years, and there are worries that more clashes could break out. Huang Nguyen, BBC News. You know, friends, during World War II, there were two theaters. There was the European theater and there was the Pacific theater. And round three of World War, will it be more of the same? Will there be, again, a Pacific theater, you know, uh, involving Japan, China, uh, Vietnam, others who claim these islands in the South China Seas, and, you know, they're in a big row about this, Ram each, you know, where they're ramming one another's boats now. And that's small fry stuff. Of course, that was the biggest incident so far. But uh, it could get worse, and uh, it could just be playing right along to what becomes part of round three of World War in the Pacific Theater as it's revived there, and then, and then, uh, and then the European theater once again. And related to the European theater, we watch things that relate to the EU. And uh, there's a story from today's news that asks the question, how does the EU affect your daily life? Now, the question is being posed mostly from the point of view from of those who live in Europe. And yet, you know, you could think it a little deeper and a little further. Those in the U.S. could also be asking, hey, how does, how does uh, what they do in the EU uh, affect our daily life, the daily life of people in the United States? Well, it can, and it, def <laughs> it definitely will. Um, but in Europe, from the food that people there eat to the toys children play with, especially we're talking about people in, in let's say, the U.K., how much does being part of the European Union affect the daily lives of the people in the UK? In two weeks' time, voters across Britain will get the chance to choose their MEP, their member of uh, the European Parliament, who will then be able to influence laws made in the EU. The BBC's European correspondent Matthew Price left Brussels for the day and headed to the to the UK to find out how EU rules affect everyone in Britain. Out of Brussels, but not of course out of the EU. Welcome to Banbury, where European laws govern daily life. Pick anywhere on the high street, I chose number 21 and a fry up. Full English, sir. Lovely, thank you. Enjoy. Thanks. Basically, everything you see on this plate is affected by EU rules. So, for instance, the way the pigs that produce the bacon are reared, the meat content in the sausage, the seeds and the pesticides used to grow the crops in the first place. In fact, EU legislation also regulates how many hours the people who pick the vegetables can actually work out in the fields. But quite often, British standards are higher than Brussels standards. So, for instance, with eggs, most of those that you buy in this country will be of a superior food safety quality. Thank you very much. The EU's affected the people who serve us, like Lukas, the Polish chef here. But not, of course, the currency we use. There you go. Thank Cheers. You. Thanks a lot. Cheers. So what about our children? I guess. Do you think the EU rules have, would have any impact on a place like this? No, I don't think so. You'd be wrong. All toys sold in Britain have to meet EU safety standards. And carry this mark. I don't think you realise what the impact would be if it was the UK, Europe. You trust the fact that there is cover for you know, health and safety for your child, for food standards, for anything else. As for maternity leave, British women can have more time off than the minimum set by Brussels. Out of town on the industrial estate, 
This company has to comply with EU rules so it can sell its metal detectors in Europe's single market. The benefit is the fact that we can trade easily in the EU with the trade barriers gone and we can exhibit our products there. The downside is the cost that associated with perhaps complying to some of the legislation that comes out of there and some of the red tape. So back to Brussels where British MEPs and ministers help create EU laws. Laws that affect everyone across this land. Matthew Price, BBC News, Banbury. Okay, friends, and um, going to a report related to what U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry is saying that uh, he's willing to do the U on behalf of the United States to provide intelligence and hostage negotiations expertise to assist Nigeria in the search for more than 230 kidnapped girls. Let's listen to what he has to say and then I'll have uh, some commentary, a comment about that after we hear from U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry. Today I spoke with uh, President Goodluck Jonathan uh, on behalf of President Obama and offered, uh, on behalf of President Obama, offered America's uh, support for Nigeria in their response to this crisis. Our embassy in Abuja is prepared to form a coordination cell that could provide expertise on intelligence, investigations, and hostage negotiations, and to help facilitate information sharing and victim assistance. And uh, President, uh, the President was, uh, President Goodluck Jonathan was uh, very happy to receive this offer and ready to move on it immediately. And we are immediately engaging uh, in order to implement this. We remain deeply concerned about the welfare of these young girls, and we want to provide whatever assistance is possible in order to help uh, for their safe return to their families. Ah, okay, friends, now some commentary regarding what <clears throat> the uh, Secretary of State John Kerry on behalf of United States President Barack Obama has offered in, to, in assisting uh, Nigeria in the search for more than 230 kidnapped girls. The uh, vast majority of the girls were seized from their school in Borno, Nigeria on April 14 and the leader of the Islamist group Boko Haram, you saw in video two nights ago we showed here, you, you saw the leader himself standing there in a video that they'd put on YouTube th threatening to sell the girls. Now the United States is offering to get involved and help get those girls back. I mean, realistically, friends, when you're dealing with a terrorist group like that, how realistic is it you're going to get those terrorists to give those girls back alive and they've already said they've sold some of the girls into slavery as wives to uh, men where they auction them off and sell them sell the girls as wives what, what reasonable chance do you think the help of the United States is going to uh, do in helping get these girls back you know after the 230 girls were abducted last week, or last week on April 14, so that's a little less than a month ago, just last Sunday night, here it is Tuesday night now. Let's see, are we, this is May 7, are we Tuesday night? Yeah, I think, I think we are. And, uh, no, we're Wednesday night, but still only three nights ago, Sunday night, the Boko, Boko Haram leader, uh, they seized eight more girls between the ages of 12 and 15. This was just last Sunday night. They kidnapped these eight more girls in northeastern Nigeria. Uh, so here the United States is saying, oh, hey, we're going to help you with this. We're going to help you get these girls back. Meanwhile, Sunday, just last Sunday night, Eight more girls were kidnapped. Uh, you know, there's a verse in... There's two chapters that talk about blessings and cursings to a nation when you, uh, when you obey God, He blesses you, and when you, um, 
when you don't, you lose, you not only lose those blessings, you get just the opposite. And one of those is in Deuteronomy 28, and I'm thinking the other one is in Leviticus 14. No. And one of them talks about breaking the pride of your power. I put that up on the screen the other day. And uh, Deuteronomy 28, or it, maybe I got it backward. Deuteronomy 28, yeah. Hearken diligently, observe to do all, and blessed will you be. But if you will not hearken to the eternal your God to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you this day, you know, we don't even, we, people make fun of keeping God's law. You know, he's, he tells us how we should live. He tells us how marriage is between a man and a woman. God tells us in his word that and this is the top of the law. This supersedes any other law. God tells us that I'll give you over to a reprobate mind if you do crazy things like man with man. That's perversion. And we look at Sodom and Gomorrah where they had gone sexually crazy. And they had gone into such perversity that God had to, to annihilate that city and, and burn it and blast it. And he tells us that if we obey, we get blessing, 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 blessing. But if we don't obey, uh, we, we get cursing, and he'll break the pride of your power. So here the United States not obeying God and under the curse of having the pride of his power broken, which we can see over and over in situations again. Now look, we threaten Russia. Russia grabs off Crimea. They just ignore the threat. What kind of power does the United States possess anymore? It, it's not a power that frightens its enemies. <laughs> the enemy says, toodaloo, tough, tough, you know. And, and the United States threatens sanctions. They say, Poo on sanctions, what we look at is a strong arm. You know, and there's a man God called Mr. Armstrong, who, through whom God gave the opening of the seals of Revelation. Let me pull those up on the screen for us for a moment. The understanding of these seals, God opened up and gave to us the correct understanding through, by and through his servant, who he showed us to be his servant, as Revelation 1 1 tells us, God opened them up to Jesus Christ to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Shortly come to pass. These things were opened up during the lifetime of Mr. Herbert W. Armstrong, and they were opened up by and through Mr. Armstrong to show mankind that Mr. Armstrong is the servant God is using for the end of time to reveal to man, to unveil these sealed prophecies of revelation which you know were sealed back in Daniel's time even before John wrote these things in in uh, revelation and John wanted to know who wrote them what they meant and even John God told him sorry John uh, this is not for you to understand either like Daniel said it's for the latter days which happen has happened is are, are the now days, today's days. So these things were opened up by God through Mr. Herbert Armstrong, a strong arm who told us to, pre to prepare to, to reduce our standard of living in these days. Why? Because the United States, the UK, people are not obeying God and his commandments and his statutes, which are made for man. There's a law of love. There's a law that says, first of all, love God. They tell you how to love God. And second of all, how to love your neighbor. Four about how to love God. Six about how to love your neighbor. We ignore most of those. And we're under a curse because of it. Well, friends, I've got something relates to something God made that if men could understand it, they would understand that what happens up in the sky is because that's the way God made it to happen and occur. But you'll see some great beauty in this video showing how researchers have created a simulation of the universe's what they call 
evolution. There's a certain evolution in the universe. God made it to be a continuing thing, but what some NASA scientists and others don't understand is that a lot of what they see happening out there is because God continues to have a hand on it. He sustains it. But if we can overlook the fact that they're going to call this an evolution, you know, the way God made it to happen and the way he, he is involved in keeping these things and the atoms and all that give birth to stars and galaxies and what have you, he keeps all that going. He makes that happen for us. But here is the BBC's science correspondent, uh, Peleb Gosh, explaining the recent finds in this video. This computer simulation compresses 14 billion years into two and a half minutes. Watch how the universe unravels. First, strands of mysterious material in blue called dark matter sprawl across the emptiness of space like branches of a cosmic tree. Fast forward a couple of billion years and the pink glows show the seeds from which galaxies will one day form. Billions more years pass and there are cataclysmic explosions from which, a little bit later, the universe as we know it begins to emerge. And around now, the Earth and our own solar system begins to form. So this simulation essentially tells us how the universe evolves in front of our own eyes. And what we can see here is how gas and stars and eventually uh, planets and us form in this universe. And the amazing thing about this simulation that is really strikingly close to the real universe. This is a picture of the universe taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. Now compare it with the universe created in a computer published in the journal Nature. It's hard to tell the difference. For hundreds of years, astronomers have used telescopes to see distant stars and galaxies. From what they saw, they developed their ideas of how the universe began and how it evolved. But now, for the first time, they're able to recreate the universe in a computer. That means they can test out new theories and really get to grips with how the cosmos works. It's a big step forward. It's going to be incredibly helpful to cosmologists like me to figure out fundamental properties of the universe. This simulation is the best estimate yet of how the universe evolved and how it may develop in the future. Palab Ghosh, BBC News. Except for that ending comment, friend, as to how it evolved, is really they were able to simulate something that relates to how God has created the universe and they misunderstand the point that God sustains the universe. He's actively involved with the universe to this very day, hour, minute, and moment. Friends, we have just enough time to show you an update on the missing MH370 Malaysian flight with a report from John Sudworth. From the moment flight MH370 failed to arrive in Beijing, it was clear something must have gone badly wrong. But two months on, we're no nearer to knowing what or why. In the early days, media attention focused on the two passengers known to have boarded the flight using stolen passports. But any link to terrorism was quickly downplayed. The men were economic migrants. Meanwhile, a massive multinational search was underway, scouring waters in the South China Sea directly below the intended flight path. But the mystery was only deepening. It emerged that Malaysian military radar had tracked the plane, turning off its planned route and heading west across the peninsula. Less than an hour before, it had left Kuala Lumpur as normal, the last communication from the flight deck signing off from Malaysian air traffic control gave no sign of distress. Malaysian 370, contact Ho Chi Minh 120.9. All right, friends, we'll end right there that we're out of time for this Wednesday night report on Nightcast. God willing and the creek don't rise, we'll be back again Thursday night, tomorrow night with the current day's news related to the Bible and prophecy here on Nightcast. Until next time, your host Stephen Lloyd Gilbert saying good night, friends. You have been watching Nightcast with Stephen Lloyd Gilbert. 
Nightcast can be seen Sunday through Thursday nights here on COGTV.org. Tonight's program is also available anytime on demand in the COGTV.org video archive.